All right, myth number 10. Myth number 10 is one of my favorites. I think I've said that for every myth. They're all my favorite. Myth number 10. Dark-skinned women who talk about colorism are insecure and jealous. <laughs> Should I even entertain this myth? I think I will. Dr. Sarah Webb, aka me, of Colorism Healing. I'm really excited about today's topic, debunking myths about colorism or colorism myths. Several of you were active in the comments talking about some of the myths that you hear going on a lot about colorism. And so I have 10, 10 myths that I'm going to share today. Also, my apologies, my allergies are flaring up. So if you hear me sounding a little nasally or um, my voice gets scratchy, bear with me. I'm not like sick or anything. It's really just sinuses and allergies. But I'm happy to be here nonetheless. That, that, that doesn't dampen my excitement to be talking with you all. And so in debunking common myths about colorism, I'm limiting myself to 10 because you all know I try to keep these to an hour, <laughs> and there are so many. So I'm always open to do a part two if more of them come through. Sarah Bestwill, thank you for the badge. Already, just in the intro. <laughs> That's so sweet of you. Thank you. Um, hey, Lucy Los, always good to see you here. Um, oh, th thank you. Sarah Bestwill says she loves the lip color. So y'all know I don't wear makeup, um, but I like lipstick. I like lip color. I just don't often fool with it. I'm not like, I'm very low maintenance <laughs> with my hair, my skincare routine. But I was, I saw an ad for this like matte lipstick and I was like, that's so cute. I want to try it. Um, but also like dark skinned women wearing red lipstick is a thing. So here you go. <laughs> um, so yeah. And, uh, and as always in your comments, in the live chat, but also in the recordings if you're watching the playback on youtube or listening to the podcast or igtv you can also add your thoughts and questions but these 10 myths are just the ones that are most common to me and like things i see repeatedly in comments or direct messages are just you know floating around the internet in general and in your comments several of you also co-sign that you hear these myths a lot too so they're, they're going to sound familiar to many of you and uh yeah so let's jump into it. So the first myth, wait, I think I, oh, Black Night 06, 26.2, Ray Ballard in Atlanta, running for life. I don't think I ever knew your real name. Your real name is Ray. <laughs> That's nice. Thank you for sharing that. Everyone else, let me know how you're doing today and where you're tuning in from. I forgot to ask. I usually always ask where you're watching from, what the weather is like, where you are, and how you're doing. Um, hey, clouds blush. Um, I am well. I am well. I just have allergies. So again, my apologies. Thank you, Pris and Prisandoval, for buying a badge. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to Jandel Crutch. Um, Jandel Crutch bought badges during your last three live videos. Wow. Consistent support. Ah, Brianna Holt from Brooklyn, New York. What's up, Brooklyn? I'm going to be in New York in January, so maybe we could do coffee or something. Um, oh, and would love to interview you for my book. See? Excellent. I don't know what your timeline is like, but I could definitely do a virtual interview. Or if not, you know, like I said, I'll be in New York in January. So, yeah, definitely um, email me or send me a direct message. Hey, Lynn Tejeda Elliott. Hi from Minneapolis, Minnesota. How's it going? I have a lot of Minnesota peeps after living in Illinois for a little while. All right, so I've greeted all of my viewers. Um, Deep House Nation from Chicago, but in Alabama. The sea moss don't always work for allergies either. <laughs> I haven't even tried sea moss. I might give that a try because I haven't even tried it yet. 
Um, hi from Boston, Sarah Bestwill. Oh, it's rainy. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. It makes me feel like I know y'all like offline when I hear about your lives. Okay, so 10 colors and myths. Let's see if we can get through this and if I can keep my voice the whole time. The first myth that I want to address <laughs> is the fact, or is not the fact, is the myth that colorism is a myth. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. So there are people out there who, who will say that colorism is fake, colorism is made up, um, Someone, I think one of my followers recently told me that Kevin Samuel said that dark-skinned women made up colorism or something like that, right? So there is like this strand of people who say we're just making up colorism. It's all in our head. It's an illusion. We just are looking for a reason to be upset. And actually, when I first started blogging about colorism back in 2011, um, somebody I went to school with, like middle school with or whatever, was like, oh, I'm dark skinned and I've never experienced anything like this. Like y'all are just looking for a reason to be mad, right? And so I think it is actually a common myth that people think colorism is fake. And before dictionaries caught on to the word colorism, so for a long time, dictionaries were not recognizing colorism as a word. Most of them are now. Um, but before that, people were using that as um, a way to gaslight folks and say, this is a made up word. And when I type it into my tweet it has a squiggly red line under it so it's not even a real thing you're making this up um never mind the fact that all words are made up but it is very much easy to ignore and i i, I say i've said this before like if someone is saying that colorism doesn't exist at all that's usually a red flag for me that i don't want to engage with the conversation further because i think in 2021 there's enough valid information on colorism that's out there and that's accessible to people that you're you're choosing willful ignorance right and so when people are choosing to remain oblivious choosing to not acknowledge the facts then i i walk away i disengage i'm like okay <laughs> so with that myth um i think the the research, the testimony, and even, you know, believing a dark-skinned person when they say, oh, I experienced this, um, should be enough for you to say, oh, this is the thing that happens, right? And so even to the, the dark-skinned person who was like, well, I'm dark-skinned and I was never treated this way, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I use this analogy a lot, I've never been mugged, but that doesn't mean people who are mugged are lying about it, right? Like, I've never been carjacked. That doesn't mean carjackings don't happen. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, intentional and willful ignoring and denial that colorism is a real thing. So that was myth number one. We got nine more to go, y'all. Hang in there with me. <laughs> um, uh, Lynn Sahada Elliott says, I met you from my employer, Federal Reserve Bank. Yes, I do remember you. I really enjoyed meeting everyone on that webinar. Lucid Low says, people try to say it's only an ugly girl experience. Uh-huh. Yeah. People said that about OG on the Basketball Wives when she was complaining about the colorism she experienced from the other cast members. And they were saying like, no, I've seen a lot of pretty dark-skinned girls and you just ain't it. You're just unattractive. You're just ugly. And that's what you're experiencing. So definitely using that as the excuse. Oops. Um... Black Knight 06, 26.2 says, the same argument that racists use, racism doesn't exist. Miss me with that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yes, the same argument that white people make. They say, oh, racism is not a problem. You're making this up. Racism doesn't exist anymore, right? And so there's this outright refusal to see the facts. And it's like, I, I can't, you know, that's a brick wall. I'm not going to try to tear down with my bare hands. <laughs> Um, Deep House Nation 7 says, tell the colorist deniers I'm black and never got mistreated by the cops and see what they say. Ha! Deep House Nation 7, always coming through with the deep thoughts. <laughs> always. I love that strategy. <laughs> yes. All right. So myth number two, y'all already know that this myth was on the list. It is the myth that colorism goes both ways yes 
And so I, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here in terms of the people who are watching my lives and stuff like that. Um, but one, colorism is systemic. And in society, there's no evidence that lighter skinned people are at a disadvantage relative to darker skinned people. Like there's just not evidence that that hierarchy is inverted in any area of life, right? So you're not gonna go to a school and be like, oh my gosh, all of the light skinned kids are getting suspended at higher rates than the dark skinned kids, right? Like we just don't see that inversion of the hierarchy anywhere. But to be clear, when people say colorism goes both ways, they're often talking about instances when a dark skinned person says something mean or rude to a light skinned person, right? And that's also not reverse colorism because colorism is not about treating people mean. It's not about being mean. Colorism is the ideology that dark skin is inherently inferior to light skin and that darker skinned people are inherently inferior and that lighter skinned people are inherently superior. That's the ideology of colorism. And so a dark skinned person being mean to you is not the reverse of that because it's, it's not coming from an ideology of light skin inferiority, right? And so if a dark skinned girl says, oh, she thinks she's all that, she's not reversing the ideology of inferiority, right? She is actually responding to the fact that you are privileged in society, right? And that's the nuance. And so what I want, what I would like light-skinned people to start doing, um, instead of saying, oh, they hate me because I'm light-skinned or they hate me just because I'm light-skinned, is to start saying, oh, they hate the fact that I have light-skinned privilege. Because that's the difference. Right? A lot of people want to say, oh, they hate me because I'm light skinned. No, they don't. They hate light skin privilege and they hate the way that they observe or perceive you benefiting from light skin privilege or actively exploiting or perpetuating light skin privilege. Right? It's not just because you're light skinned, it's because they are frustrated with and angry about the way that light skin has been privileged and valued more highly than darker skin. And so there, it's not an inversion of, or even, you know, pulling, a, pulling someone's hair at school, right? You have a lot of light-skinned girls who had longer, straighter hair say, oh, they pulled my hair at school. Um, they used to chase me home after school, right? Like all those things are terrible things. Like I'm not saying anyone deserves to be mistreated. But again, colorism is the belief that one group is inherently inferior and inherently less valuable, less attractive, less intelligent, less competent, right? And that another group is inherently better and more virtuous and has more value and status in society. And so all of those negative experiences you're having are not flipping that ideology. They're not inverting that perception. They're responding to the hierarchy that exists. And I think that's important. So again, stop, stop saying they hate me because I'm light-skinned or stop saying they don't like me because I'm light-skinned because that's not what it is. What they are responding to and reacting to is your privilege. But a lot of light-skinned people aren't willing to say that because they're also in denial that they have privilege to begin with, right? So yeah, myth number two <laughs> was the big one. It's probably like, that's huge, 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 huge. So I have to start with that. Um, let me see what y'all are saying though. Because y'all are smart and always come with the gems. Uh, Mellow and Chill says the poorest people in literally every country are always the darkest. Right. That is the social hierarchy is not going to be upended because someone pulled your hair in class. It's just not how it works. Um, Lucid Low says, LOL, I just saw a video on YouTube about colorism where they tried to claim it went both ways, but dark skinned people suffer from it more. Hmm. Um, see, Asima Keda says, yes, I struggle with this one. So Lucid Lowe's, your comment makes me think of something else I was um, writing about on the blog post. And that's 
when we say when people say colorism goes both ways there's a fallacious assumption that the system of colorism consists only of light-skinned people mistreating and discriminating against dark-skinned people but colorism is actually a system in which all people of all races of all shades discriminate against and marginalize dark-skinned people and so there's no like the both ways argument oversimplifies exactly what colorism is to begin with because dark-skinned people can perpetuate colorism against other dark-skinned people a dark-skinned person can put the dark-skinned child at the back of the class and elevate the light-skinned student to the front of the class and promote them to president and senior you know, play leading roles in the play, right? White people perpetuate colorism against dark-skinned people. Um, Asian people perpetuate colorism against dark-skinned people. And so it's not um, a both ways thing because dark-skinned people are getting it from multiple sides, right? It's not like it's coming at us from one direction. It's coming at us from multiple directions. So I think even that phrasing oversimplifies what colorism is. And then uh, Mellow and Chill, your comment about the poorest people in every country being the darkest skinned people. I talk about um, money a lot because people tend to get money, right? And so I, I used the example before that if a poor person steals a rich person's wallet, it's not reverse colorism. <laughs> you, it might be painful. It might be harmful to the rich person. They might be... Um, upset they might have to go through all kinds of things to replace their id and it might be very troublesome and bothersome but that's not reverse classism right and i think most people get that like classism is not going to be reversed because working class folks are rude to rich people no <laughs> no uh let's see Thank you for the badge, Lucid Los. Also, you've also bought badges for the last three lives. So very, I'm super fanning you right back. Um, no Kook says, I love your lipstick and hair. You're so beautiful and inspiring, Dr. Webb. Thank you. Yeah, the lipstick is a rare sight. So this is like a very historic live stream for me. <laughs> um, nah, she's speaking up about oppression. Um, Let's see, you could have chose any career you chose to preach. <laughs> I love y'all so much. Y'all are so fun. <laughs> Such a good explanation. Melo and Chill, how do you respond to, well, it's still not appropriate or kind to say derogatory things towards light-skinned people? I would say, yeah, that's fine. Right. Like, I don't promote saying derogatory things to anybody. But the solution is not going to be had by ignoring where it really comes from. So I've also said in the past is that for light-skinned people who are bothered by getting derogatory comments, you can find solutions to that by being honest about the root cause of it. The root cause of it is your privileged status in society, right? And so for light-skinned people and other people who support light-skinned folks to say, oh, well, it's wrong that, you know, light-skinned people get told they're this or told that they're stuck up or whatever. What I'm trying to tell you is that the solution is to dismantle the system that privileges light people, right? Like, if you want that vitriol to stop, if you want that backlash to stop, then you have to root out the system that people are responding to in the first place. And I think that's also one of the nuances that gets overlooked. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I'm not condoning mistreating anybody. I don't, that's not me, right? Like I know some people are like, well, oh well, so what? <laughs> but me personally, I'm like, no, nah, we don't have to um, stoop to that level, right? As, as uh, in responding to colorism, it doesn't have to come from that place. But I, I understand why it does, though. I understand it, right? Um, and part of what I hope to do is show people 
more constructive ways to channel the pain that they feel as a result of colorism and help people find more effective ways to resist the system, right? Because that's the other thing too, like belittling a light-skinned person does nothing to the larger system of colorism. And so I think that as much as we hate it and as much as it angers us and frustrates us, I do think that there are healthier for us, but also more effective in terms of the politics of the situation than just targeting individual light-skinned people. Uh, it says, it's not light skin versus dark skin. True. Clouds bless. Would you say all colorism is rooted in anti-blackness? That's my understanding, but I had a convo with a light-skinned Mexican woman who was really upset by that idea. So I think anti-blackness exas exacerbates colorism. I know that in some parts of the world, colorism existed within their own society, like without in encounters with black folks, without encounters with the continent of Africa, right? Especially like Asian countries, like centuries, centuries of colorism. Um, but I think colorism in non-black spaces is manifested in anti-blackness very often, right? Um, but I think there are histories of people that didn't really have contact with black folks for a long time and they were already perpetuating colorism. So some of it is not rooted in anti-blackness per se, but in our contemporary society, it very much is part of all colorism at this point. And, and with the rise of globalization, right? Because at this point, everyone has encountered Black folks. And so that is like the inevitable end. So if you're a colorist just amongst South Asians, for example, or if you're a colorist just amongst Indigenous Americans, for example, then you're logically going to be colorist towards Black people and try to um, distance yourself from that as much as possible. See, light skin equals social capital. Yes, absolutely. Lucid Lowe says, that reminds me of the old your mama and you're so black jokes. Being black is fine, but being too black to people is bad. Mm-hmm, yep. Uh, Deep House Nation says, I slightly disagree. I think lighter skin, especially women, are fully aware of the colorist caste system. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm not sure what I said to the contrary, but I do agree. Um, <laughs> Saint Kome says, we ain't ready. This is truth, people. Um, okay, let me keep going. Oh, so many comments. I want to get to them all. Okay, my third myth, though, um, is that colorism only affects dark-skinned people. So this is a controversial myth, right? Um, but colorism can affect anyone who is darker than someone else even if they're not dark at all, right? So I know people are going to be like, what are you saying? What are you saying? So this is, you know, we talk about the safe brown, right? That this being a safe brown and how safe brown people kind of, kind of fly under the radar and don't get any vitriol from either side. But in the research studies though, right? Like safe, being a safe brown really only plays out in our interpersonal relationships. But in the research studies, brown people, right? So not dark-skinned people, like mid-tone, medium brown people are also disadvantaged relative to light-skinned people, right? That even people in the middle of the skin tone spectrum are still going to receive less social economic status relative to lighter-skinned people of the same race. And so you don't even have to be that dark to be considered too dark to be seen as employable or intelligent or not be seen as a threat, right? Um, and I think some of the, one, I think one of the studies that really helped, helped me start to see that was the one on marriage rates because they broke in the one on school suspensions, right? So the one on marriage rates, they had light-skinned women, medium brown women, and dark-skinned women. And there were there was like a 10% um, a gap between light-skinned women and brown women and like a 20% gap 
between uh, light-skinned women and dark-skinned women, right? But there were still differential outcomes for the people who were brown-skinned compared to people who were light-skinned. And then the other one with the school suspensions is that they even disaggregated further. And so they were talking about how the students with very light skin, as opposed to light skin, as opposed to medium brown skin, as opposed to dark skin, as opposed to very dark skin. And so they had five different gradations of skin tone. And you guessed it, it was a spectrum of privilege, right? So yes, the light-skinned people got suspended less often than the dark-skinned people, but they still got suspended more often than the very light-skinned people, right? And I know that's hard for people to wrap their head around, and I know, like, some people say, oh, well, we shouldn't use those labels because it's creating division or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's not creating division. It's measuring division that already exists. It's measuring and observing and reporting on the inequalities that already exist. And so... I thought I think those kinds of research studies are really eye opening in terms of how every degree, every shade darker makes a difference and every shade lighter makes a difference. And so I say that like both to people who may not be the lightest person in their family, they might not be the lightest person in the room, but they can still acknowledge like, yo, like. I was told I was too dark, but I'm several shades lighter than many other people. And so I'm still like on that side of the privileged spectrum. And I think seeing as a spectrum and realizing like there, there are people on either side of me in line, right? Like I'm not at the front of the line, but I'm also not at the back of the line. And that matters. That does matter. Um, so to my brown skin folks who often say they feel left out of colorism conversations, one, I hope you realize that you are also being negatively impacted by colorism, right? Like for the medium skin tone folks, like you're still not earning as much money as light skin people. Like light, the lighter people with the lighter skin tones are still going to receive less prison time than you, right? Are still less likely to be racially profiled. And so that could mean we have a larger coalition of people fighting to upend this system, right? And so I don't want my brown skin or medium tone people to feel like they're safe and in the middle and can kind of like just kind of wash their hands of this because you're also negatively impacted by the spectrum of privilege. Um, myth four. I'm going to do myth four before I read your comments because it's really simple. And that is the myth that colorism only affects black people, also African American people specifically. And um, I read I read a comment not too long ago, someone was saying, oh, to non black people, we don't even pay attention to the light skin, dark skin thing. And I'm like, child, who are you coming from with, with that comment? Because a lot of non black people are very, 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 very much explicitly and overtly colorist. Not to mention the subconscious colorism and the subconscious implicit biases, right? So really simple. I think that myth is easily debunked. Asia it has been the fastest growing, largest market for skin bleaching creams for many years now. Um, even amongst white people, the idea of the Aryan features having blonde hair and blue eyes, like that's been a thing for centuries. Um, Latinx folks, it's interesting because Latinx, Latino, Hispanic is an ethnicity, and so they can also be racially black. But in our mainstream society, those two things are seen as separate. Even today, even still today, most people see Lat Latino, Hispanic identity as separate from black identity. And so you hear people say things like, oh, I'm not black, I'm Colombian. I'm not black, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm not black, I'm, you know, Brazilian. And so... When I'm saying that, I know that, yes, there are Black Latinx folks, but to the popular consciousness, it's separate. And so even amongst Latinx people, they have mehranda la raza, right, which is whitening future generations. It's called bettering the race, and bettering the race equates to making future generations whiter and lighter. And so... And even, you know, we don't talk about this group of people as much, but even Indigenous Americans, right, like Native Americans 
have colorism and they've internalized white supremacy themselves. And, you know, I, I read a lot, um, even one of my con writing contest participants this year talked about the experience of being um, a black native person and how even amongst indigenous Americans, there is a hierarchy where whiter and lighter features are privileged and seen and accepted more. All right, so we're almost halfway through. Oh, y'all are so active. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Apologies, y'all. I had a good little crowd, too. Hopefully, uh, y'all got my message about the sound being off. Welcome back. Welcome back. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It should be by the TV. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. Thank you all for sticking with me through, um, as some of you say, IG being colorists <laughs> and Mercury retrograde hating on the sister. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So let's continue then. That means I lost the comments, though. Um, I didn't get to read them all. Um, so I apologize. I know that there were some really juicy comments that I was in the process of reading when my sound went off. Um, but I'm sure you all will have other things to say. So I'll go on with myth number five. And that is similar to the, the previous myth. And that's that colorism is only perpetuated within a race, within one racial group, right? So it's only African-Americans against African-Americans. And nope, that's not true either. Colorism can be perpetuated across races. So an Asian American or an Asian person can have a preference for working with or 
um, seeing lighter skinned African Americans over darker skinned African Americans as well. And so our implicit bias against dark skin does not stop at our own race, right? Like that's not how implicit bias works. What I will say though, is that sometimes what we're observing when anti-blackness is the cause or the source of something, a, a non-black dark skinned person will be favored over a lighter skinned black, black person, right? And so we have to kind of pay attention to the when anti-blackness is at play because that might seem to override colorism in that instance, but not necessarily. Yeah? Okay. Um, the first black enslaved people were all very dark skinned, light skinned, or mixed race. Oh, that's you? <laughs> but yeah, non blacks can be colorist. I read a study the other day about white men saying they prefer black women with white features. Yeah, there's a really good book on that called Mythologizing the Black Woman by Brittany C. Slatton. And yeah, it's really enlightening and really informative. Um, so Richard Miles, 4747, you always spam my stuff. So I'm going to remove, remove you from the live because I don't like the spamming nature of how you engage with my platform. All right, so let's continue. <laughs> uh, yeah, ethnocentrism is a real thing. Yeah, and so sometimes people who are colorist, they're also, they're even more ethnocentric, right? So like they might prefer lighter skinned people overall, but their hatred for African-Americans might override or trump their dislike for like a dark skinned Asian person, for example. Uh, let's see. Sarah Bessel says Indian caste system also promotes light skin. So was it pro-whiteness before it was anti-blackness? Either way, began with harmful European globalization. Yeah, so I think the Indian caste system was uh, also in place even before European colonization, right? So that's one of the systems I was talking about. Like when it was just people in India, they were also having this color hierarchy amongst themselves. And so what we saw after their encounters with Europe and European colonization, it was entrenched, more deeply entrenched and concretized and exacerbated. Um, and so it takes on a more capitalist and globalized form, right? And so what European colonization did with a lot of those cultures that already had color caste systems in place was sort of commodified lighter skin. And so light skin became not just a status symbol, but it also became a global commodity. And that's why we see the rise and the explosion of things like the skin bleaching market. Um, hey, Aliette, welcome. All right, let's keep going. Uh... I hear a lot of brown people say at least they aren't black. Yes, they are dark skinned, but they are aware that being racially black puts them lower in the hierarchy. Yep, 100%. Yeah, yes, I, I agree with that. Okay, um, myth number six is one of my favorite ones to debunk, and it's quite related to the other myths, is that white people do not perpetuate colorism. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people say, well, you know, to white folks, we're all the same. And white folks just see us all as black. They're not paying attention to who's light and who's dark. And I'm like, mm, nope, wrong. <laughs> so again, when we look at implicit bias, right? And so one, I'll say, even if white people are not consciously thinking about the skin tone of black and brown folks, they are definitely implicitly thinking about it, subconsciously thinking about it. And so in that way, they're definitely perpetuating colorism, even if they're not trying to do it, right? But then when we look at, especially in the United States and places um, that had slavery, it was white people's differential treatment of us based on our skin tones that ingrained colorism in us in the first place, right? And so 
there's a long history, a long legacy of white people not only treating us differently based on what we looked like and based on whether or not we had more European ancestry than others, but they like scientifically described us different. Like sociologists and anthropologists and scientists were describing the mulatto races of people and the lighter skinned black people and the like all these other folks relative to just the pure African as they would call it, right? All of this really eugenicist type of science, they were very much distinguishing between people based on what they look like. Like they created all of this in the first place. <laughs> like it was white people noticing, hey, those folks have a different skin tone than us. Let's oppress them, <laughs> right? Like, so yeah, white people invented different treating people differently based on skin tone so to say that they all of a sudden don't notice but i think with the present day it's so much the standard it's so much the norm that they no longer have to consciously think about it right because it, it can just operate on autopilot really for so many white people but also i'll say to the research i i go i include research even though it's not the only way to explain these things. When you look at the just, justice system, employment, education, and all the colorism that takes place, a lot of times it's white judges, white lawyers, white officers, white teachers, white nurses, white doctors, right? Who are creating these inequalities that we talk about when it comes to color. So yes, they very much are treating darker skinned patients in hospitals differently than they're treating lighter skinned black patients in hospitals. Um, so yeah. Okay, I'll say my other ones. Some of these are my favorite. Uh, Sarah Bessel says, slaveholder would let light skinned slaves into the house and gave them special privileges. So any white person saying that is just lying to themselves. Yeah, but Sarah Bessel is not white people saying it, it's often black people saying it. <laughs> Oftentimes it's black people who are trying to dismiss a conversation about colorism by saying, oh, well, white people just see us as all black anyway, so we don't need to focus on colorism. Yeah. And let's see, Khalif Graham says, it's literally well documented that whites have long favored lighter blacks. These people who say otherwise are in denial. Yes. Yeah, long, yeah. They were writing it. Like they wrote the doc they were documenting their own colorism. <laughs> so it's yeah, whatever tribalism whites might have, they use their social societal to enact their views. The violence in their favoritism is the norm, racism, colorism being the norm. All right, let me keep going. So myth number seven is one of my favorites to debunk, and that is the belief that colorism is less important than racism. How many of you have heard that before? I've heard it expressed different ways, right? So they'll say, oh, we need to focus on the more important issues like racism. I actually heard a professor who shall not be named, a professor who has done, who has written articles on colorism and um, even edited a collection on colorism say like, oh, well, we need to put colorism behind us so that we can really focus on serious issues like racism. <laughs> I'm like, where is this coming from? Um, but again, so I'm repeating, I'm starting to repeat myself here because again, these myths are easily debunked. If you just do a little reading, just a little bit of reading, just check out one book from the library and you can debunk all these myths, which is one text, one text. <laughs> um, but the same inequalities that we gripe about when it comes to racism, right? Like, oh, it's so unfair that, you know, black people get harsher prison sentences than white people, right? I'm like, but the same inequality is happening relative to dark-skinned black people and light-skinned black people. And I think it's hypocritical. I think it's hypocr hypocritical to say that one form of inequality is bad, but the other type of inequality is acceptable, is okay like we're going to ignore that no and then i also say this a lot too i prefer the lens of colorism now like the more i do this work over the past years i was like you know what i actually like 
looking through the framework of colorism more than racism now than I used to because so many things that we attribute to racism are better explained through the lens of colorism. And what I'll say too, and I think I might be skipping ahead, but in a lot of these research studies, the gaps, the inequalities between people with very light skin tones and people who are white are almost negligible, are not measurable. Like a lot of the studies have no measurable differences in the outcomes of lighter skinned African American and Latinx people and those outcomes for white people. Yeah, so <laughs> I prefer to talk about colorism these days, obviously. Um, okay, and then myth number eight, Ooh, this is a good one. <laughs> Talking about colorism causes division. Yeah. So obviously, you know, I've, I've heard this a lot because I talk about colorism a lot. And people are like, oh, this is being divisive. And this is perpetuating light skin versus dark skin. And I say, one, no, colorism creates division and inequality. Me talking about it is not creating the inequality, like colorism already did that. And so being silent about colorism facilitates further division, further inequality. The only way to address the damage that colorism has been done is to acknowledge it, is to call it out, and to have dialogue about what we need to do going forward. And then I also like to say this too, because any so-called unity that requires me to stay silent is not unity. It's not. When people say, oh, you need to stop talking about this because it's divisive, then I can't be in unity with you. That you're just repressing my voice. That's not being united. You want to be united on things that you care about, on things that matter to you. That's not true unity. And also, unity can't happen unless there's an equality and justice amongst us as black people or as brown people, right? And so there's no unity without dealing with colorism. There's no unity without repairing the damage that colorism has been done. And so and don't be deceived by anyone who claims to be a warrior for unity and is therefore talking about saying we need to stop talking about colorism, right? Really what they're defending, they're not defending unity, they're defending the status quo. That's really what they're defending. Um, and then myth number nine, <laughs> I better read some comments before I get into myth number nine, cause it's a doozy. <laughs> um, clouds blushes. What are, okay. I read that good. It's so depressing. I appreciate your constant advocacy on this subject. Thank you. Khalif Graham says white people whose physical appearance is closer to whiteness are being more human and redeemable. Yep. Mm -hmm. literally more human. I can recognize your humanity more easily if you look like me, aka, you know, white. Um, Aliette says, there is the myth that white men have a preference for dark-skinned women. Yeah, I think that is a, a myth. Well, it depends on how you define preference. I think they have a fetish they might have a fetish for dark-skinned women, but that doesn't mean they have, like, a preference in the sense of, like, oh, I want to partner with you. Um, but also there are the majority of white men in thinking about, I forgot who said it. It might have been Deep House Nation about the article about how white men also report having a preference for um, lighter-skinned women with more alkaline, like thinner noses, right? Like Alicia Keys, for example, or Beyonce. And there is the majority who have that preference, right? And so I think sometimes we, the, the white men who have a preference for dark-skinned women might stand out um, because it's seen as novel. It's like a novelty or it's like, uncommon, right? And so we might focus on those examples, but the vast majority of white people have a pro-light bias. And that's, you know, professional relationships, romantic relationships, platonic relationships, whether it's implicit or not. Um, Clouds Blush says, I had a light-skinned friend say, but we're all the same to white people when I was addressing colorism to her. I hear that a lot. And I hear people say, oh, the bigots 
the K the KKK, the, the skinheads don't care if you're light skinned. I'm like, okay, but what the KKK is doing is not really impacting our day-to-day -day lives. It's the everyday folks who are in these classrooms and mistreating our darker skinned students compared to our lighter skinned students. And so we can't focus on the extremists as being the, the norm or the standard for all white people. All right. Exactly. A lot of these myths function to take the colorism convo off the table because they don't want to own up to their own colorism. Khalif Graham always coming through with the gems. Yeah, that's the that's the bottom line. <laughs> and so again, like we can I'm doing this video debunking myths about colorism, but I think to a certain degree, a lot of our work and our fight against colorism has to go beyond arguing with people who don't want to get it, right? And so, like, I, I, I like to also work with people who do get it. I like to work with, like, dark-skinned people who want to make a difference, who want to make a change. Working with, you know, non-dark-skinned people who want to make a difference and who want to make a change. And I think not spending too much of my energy trying to convince these people because... At the end of the day, they they really are invested in their own ignorance, in their own um, complicity. They want to be colorists. And even people who get it, like even people who understand colorism still like it enough to continue perpetuating it. It's really, I'm telling y'all, it's creepy how people are like, yeah, I know. And I like that. Um I had a colorist person. I'm not going to say how I know they're colorists, but they, I, I shared, this was years ago. I shared some of the stats on like dark skinned women in marriage compared to like brown skinned women and light skinned women. And this person liked the post as sort of like co-signing his colorism against dark skinned, excuse me, women. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So people get it. And they still choose it. All right. I got to keep going. Oh, my gosh. Y'all's comments. Oh, my gosh. All right. Myth number nine. Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? Light skin privilege doesn't exist. Or light skin people have the same exact experience as dark skin people. That's the myth right there. That, uh gets perpetuated a lot. And again, not just by light-skinned people. I've had brown people and dark dark people too say, oh no, they're, they're just as black as you and they don't have, their struggles are just the same as yours and all that kind of thing. So I'm repeating myself because again, these myths are easily debunked by reading a little bit. <laughs> the research shows that in all areas of life, all sectors of society, every single one, every arena, every realm of our culture, light-skinned people have favorable outcomes for them. And darker-skinned people are marginalized and systematically denied access, denied resources. Okay? And so there's that. But also what I'd like to add to this specific section, specific section, is that one, you don't have to be aware of your privilege to have it. Two, when people say to white feminists, um, oh, intersectionality matters, right? Because you have white women say, but we're all women. We're all women. And so you'll have light-skinned folks or black folks say, no, but intersectionality matters. And, you know, black women don't have the same experience as white women, right? They understand that just because we're all women doesn't mean we experience our womanhood in the same way. And yet they come back right back around and say, oh, but we're all black. <laughs> we're all black. So we have the exact same experience. You wouldn't say we're all human. We're all human, by golly. And so it doesn't matter if I'm a cis man or, you know, a white woman, 
my experience is exactly the same as yours because we're all human. <laughs> it's like it's whatever group you think we're all a part of, there are differences. There just are, okay? Um, and then three, privilege is not all or nothing. And so a lot of light-skinned people say they don't have light-skinned privilege because they had some kind of hardship or they experienced racism from white people. And it's like, yeah, you can be marginalized or oppressed for one aspect of your identity and still be privileged because of another aspect of your identity, right? Like, yes, those things can exist at the same time. And then number four, this is, um, I think, Khalif Graham or Deep House Nation or all of you, perhaps, mentioned this before, that there are so many light-skinned people, right? There are lots. There are lots of light-skinned people who actively perpetuate light skin privilege, who actively exploit their light skin privilege, who actively buy into and reinforce the system of colorism. And so I think about, this is a slight tangent, I think about how a lot of light skinned people res reply in my comments like, oh, but we also have to talk about how as a light skinned person, people tell me I'm not black enough. And I'm often not seen as black enough in my own community. And I just have an ask for my light-skinned folks, right? That rather than coming onto my page as a dark-skinned woman and complaining that you don't get told, you don't get seen as being black enough, take that energy, take the time that you're using to type out that comment on my page, go to the pages of colorists people, and check them. <laughs> I feel like that'd be a much better use of your time. <laughs> All the people on social media who are being intentionally colorist, overtly colorist, whether it's dark-skinned black men being colorists, light-skinned women being colorists, like all those people spreading colorism online, you find the need to come on my page and say and complain about not being seen as black enough, right? And so I, you know, I've been playing with the idea of writing an open letter to my light-skinned sisters in particular, right? Writing an open letter to light-skinned women. And I think that that's like one of the real things is that a lot of light-skinned people spend a lot of time um, complaining to me, complaining to dark-skinned people about how we don't accept them. And yet I'm like, but if you really wanted to make a difference around this colorism issue, you would be getting your fellow light-skinned folks in check, the ones who are like the Danny Lees of the world and the Doja Cats. And I don't know these people. I don't know nothing about these people. I just know some headlines. <laughs> okay. And like all of the regular non-famous people who are actively spreading hate about dark skin, who are actively you know, flaunting and exploiting and le trying to leverage um, light skin privilege. Like, don't come on my page and, you know, try to denounce what I'm doing. Like, go take that energy and stop the actual colorism. That's just one of my asks. And I might, I'm, I'm probably going to do an open letter at some point. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I just have one more myth to go. And I'm actually not doing too bad on time, especially considering I had to stop and restart. I did save the first part. I saved part one on my IGTV. So the first part is there. And then I'll save the second part as well. And then the podcast, it should all be one seamless thing. And on YouTube, I'll combine the parts into one video. But for my Instagram folks, um, you'll it is, it'll be two different IGTV videos. All right. Where did I leave off with these comments? Okay. These people know they are colorists, period. Agents of white supremacy. Some guy the other day told me he was aware of colorism and said, but light-skinned people are prettier. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, Khalif Graham. Yes. Deep House Nation says, clouds blush. Exactly. I'm trying not to go there, but we need to re-examine religion. Mm, I missed the comment that clouds blush made. Says gypsy girl, um, like that African guy who was arguing with me that colorism isn't a product of white supremacy. Yeah. Oh, 
ending going flow. Wow, you just taught me something new. B E I B I E C. Black in every country. I miss these. Oh, Mayoa's world coin. B I E C. Um, Clouds blush says Mayoa's world is amazing. Also has many great vids on colorism and texturism. Uh, Khalif Graham says my light mother with loose textured hair doesn't even have the same experience as my lighter sister with 4C hair. So there's no way in hell my mom could have the same experience as a dark-skinned woman. Yeah. Yeah, K-drama, Oma, tell it, Dr. Webb. I'm trying to tell it. I'm trying to tell somebody. <laughs> uh, Black 906, 26.2 says there are historically black women groups that actively engage in colorism. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I talk about light-skinned people actively perpetuating colorism, I mean, like, it has been systemically perpetuated by light-skinned people, too. Like, they have systemically reserved jobs only for other light-skinned people. They've systemically only reserved marriage into their families or, you know, schools and programs and mentor mentorships, and right? So it's not just um, their treatment of, you know, dark-skinned people on an individual level. Like, they've actively conserved and corralled wealth and resources and status for themselves, right? And so, again, go talk to them. Go go talk to them. <laughs> All right. Uh, Khalif Graham says, in an incredibly anti-Black world, being read as not Black enough can actually keep you safe. So that's nothing to cry about. Sorry. Um, light-skinned people, dark-skinned people say I'm not black. The same light-skinned people, yeah, I'm so light and pretty because I'm mixed. I'm not just black. <laughs> yes. So, Khalif Graham, you're talking about this phenomenon where um, people sort of flaunt their light-skinnedness and or racial ambiguity or, you know, even mixed race or biracial identity. But then when we talk about colorism, that's the only time, that's the only time they complain about not being seen as black enough, right? Like if we're talking about something else, they're cool with being read as mixed. They're perfectly fine and content and happy to be read as racially ambiguous or less, less black, quote unquote. But somehow, when the conversation steers towards privilege and colorism, then all of a sudden, they're sad in complaining that, oh, people don't see me as black enough, right? There's also, I was going to do a separate video on this, but I'll just say it here. Um, a lot of times being told you're not black enough is not even about how you look. A lot of times people get told they're not black enough because of actual cultural differences, right? So a dark-skinned person can get told they're not black enough because of how they talk or because of how they dress, right? And so in a lot of cases, the not black enough complaint is not even relevant to, relevant to colorism specifically because when people look at you and say, oh, you're not, you're not really black, they're not just talking about your skin tone. A lot of times they're talking about the way you speak, you know, like other cultural nuances, maybe because of the music you listen to, right? And so it's really a, a cultural statement as well and not even because you're light-skinned necessarily. Um, <laughs> thank you, Souls and G-Spots. This is my hair looks great. So I'm, I'm really going on some tangents here. Y'all bear with me because uh, on TikTok, I had got into like this really big hair thing People were like really mad at me for what I was posting about hair. So I just want to say that the, this hair that you see is like a week after my wash and go. A week after my washing. So I wash my hair. I let it air dry. A couple of days go by. I add um, some olive oil to it and I just finger pick it. I literally just stretch it. I shape it like that. This is literally what I've been doing for the past week after I, when I get dressed, right? Because when I wake up, it is flat in the back because that's how my hair is. And so when I wake up, I just, I, I pull it back into a round shape like this. So thank you. <laughs> All right. The last myth that I'd like to share 
<laughs> Lucy Lowe's. Lucy Lowe's read your comment. Lucy Lowe says, according to the memes on Instagram, you're not black if you don't eat ice cube sandwiches. <laughs> um, Deep House Nation says, facts, they ain't complaining about that promotion over there. More talented, melanated counterparts. Yes, Deep House Nation, right? So, like, also compl complain about the benefits that you're receiving, right? Like, what if light-skinned people started complaining when they get greeted at the counter and their dark-skinned friend doesn't? What if light-skinned people started complaining that the only people in executive positions at the company are lighter-skinned people of color? Like, what if they started complaining about those things? That's, that would be helpful. <laughs> All right, myth number 10. Myth number 10 is one of my favorites. I think I've said that for every myth. They're all my favorite. Myth number 10. Dark-skinned women who talk about colorism are insecure and jealous. <laughs> Should I even entertain this myth? I think I will. Um, so I would ask, and I, I thought of this because I'm literally looking at a picture of Martin Luther King. So I say, you know, I would tell ask those people, so was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. insecure about his race? because he spoke out about racism? Hmm. Somehow that logic doesn't apply to any other social justice issue. Are people who attend Black Lives Matter protests insecure about being black? <laughs> and so what I'd like to say is that dark-skinned women who have the courage to face all the vitriol and speak out about colorism are actually displaying, displaying audacious self-love, radical acts of self-love. And it is our love for ourselves that compels us to stand up for ourselves, that compels us to say, hey, this harmful thing is happening to me and I don't like it. And I want to do something about it. And I want you to do something about it. I want you to stop it. That's actually coming from a place of self-love, not insecurity. So, and that's that on that. <laughs> um, all right, let me read these comments because I'm done with my 10 myths. I'm really sad that um, I had never, I've gone live every week for almost two years and I've never like had my sound go out like that. But, you know, if that's the worst thing that happens, this Mercury retrograde, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, let's see what some of these comments I missed. Um, man, number 10 is my favorite now, too. <laughs> Don't forget bitter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitter is a, a very, very favorite insult to, to hurl at folks. Um, this is perpetuated throughout the entertainment industry. You need to start canceling these people. Zero tolerance. Career 05. I agree with the zero tolerance thing. Um, Amanda Seals, uh, people talk about how she has a lot of good things to say about race. But when I saw her Breakfast, Breakfast Club interview a few years ago and how she just actively could not acknowledge light skin privilege, like actively saying she didn't think she had any advantages as a light skin person, I was like, mm. Okay, well, I can't do it. I can't deal with it. Like, my, nope. Mm -mm. I'll listen to some other people talk about racism. Thanks. Uh, me, I was told I talk white. I'm not black. Black because of my hair, mind you. I am dark skinned. See? Yes, Gypsy girl was also told she was not black enough because of um, how she talks and because of her hair, right? And so even when we're talking about colorism, uh, it's not helpful to offer complaints about not being seen as black enough because you have to ask yourself, was that even about the fact that I was light-skinned or was that about something else, right? Because then too, like, if we're talking about mixed-race people and biracial people, especially if you're raised with your non-black family, if you're raised, you know, around your non-black family, whether they're white or Indian or, you know, some indigenous, um, you are going to have different cultural 
touchstones than other black people around you. And so it's not even, um, I think it's, there's nothing wrong with saying like, hey, I'm not like those other black kids in my class. I don't talk like them. And I understand that they're like, oh, we don't really get you. Now, I know it um, can create loneliness and a sense of alienation, but what if, you, what if people started engaging with black people, not trying to assert that I'm just as black as you, but engage with black people from a space of I am who I am. And despite our differences, we can still be cool, right? Like, I wonder if that's the approach we can start to take. It's not, oh, I have to be seen as exactly the same as you to feel accepted. Like, no, I am a unique individual for various reasons. And that's when we have true belonging, right? When we can coexist and commune and fellowship with each other, not because we're all seen as exactly the same, but because we're allowed to have our differences be what they are. But yeah, okay. I'll also say I have not had to deal with being told I wasn't. Well, actually that's not true. <laughs> I've also, there were, there were like black kids in my schools too. They were like, well, you ain't black like us though. I have, I have, I have experienced that. <laughs> um, Khalif Graham says, so true. I've been told I wasn't black enough for how I speak and I'm dark. So I never take that not black enough argument seriously. LOL. They just want, don't want to talk about colorism. Yeah. All right. I think I did good, especially with my allergies. Um, my throat held up pretty good. Um, Khalif Graham, but if we do want to talk about dark-skinned people being jealous and insecurity, why do these people act like root of these feels isn't, drumroll, colorism? Khalif Graham. That's why um, there was a comment. I think, I, think, I think you responded to this comment as well where somebody was like, oh, you know, jealous people, this, this, and that. And I was like, one, ask yourself, what would we be jealous of? Because you can't deny, you can't try to deny that light skin privilege exists and simultaneously say that we're jealous, right? Like, if you answer that question, what would dark skinned people actually be jealous of? You either do one of two things. You admit that colorism is real and that light skin privilege is real. Or you expose yourself as the colorist that you are, right? Because your response has to be like, oh, they're jealous because the light-skinned girls are pretty. Colorism. <laughs> are they jealous? You know, like you can't even say, like, if you, if you think I'm jealous, tell me exactly what I'm jealous of. Because then you have just backed yourself into a corner of having to acknowledge colorism. <laughs> um, and Seals was so defensive in the aftermath, like couldn't listen to her podcast or follow her anymore. Yeah, Fat Joe engages with black people like that. He's black like you when it benefits him, even though he isn't black at all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, all right, let me let y'all go because I know y'all getting tired. <laughs> y'all getting tired, I'm getting tired. I'm gonna just conserve my voice. I have several meetings and stuff tomorrow. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So Khalif Graham, I am definitely going to expound or elaborate on the conversation about race and racialization. Um, yeah, because I think that's, I don't think there's enough nuance in the conversations about race and racialization and why certain people are called black and why certain people are not called black and why certain people are called white. Because um, a lot of the race system was created to define whiteness, really. But again, I'll do a separate video for that. All right. Love y'all so, so much. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me, y'all. This was a, a, a strange one because of the little technical glitch. But uh, yeah, I'll see y'all next week. And hopefully there will be, it will be smooth sailing without any hiccups. All right. Take care. I love you.